All right, welcome everyone to the not quite annual um, boff, the power boff. The most important boff of the whole conference, <laughs> yes. right? Uh, I'm Peter Bergner. I lead the Linux on Power Toolchain team at IBM. And we have Seher, our, one of our maintainers. Cohen Lin was also supposed to come, but he had a little family issue, couldn't yeah. come uh, today. So we will be covering everything. So today's objective here really is just to kind of allow the wider toolchain area to ping us with problems, questions, whatever. Hopefully, uh, the discussion is going to be guided by your questions for us, but we do have a few You're assuming items. everything people will have to say are negative things. Yeah. What? Okay. Probably. Yeah. Uh, but we... Before we get started on some of that, we have some announcements from the distros in the yeah. IBM. I've mentioned to kind of like Matthias and and others that IBM would like all new major distro releases. So not point releases, but new major distro releases on PowerPC 64 LE Linux. So six, our current distro types uh, to use IEEE 128 by default for our long double types. Uh, that can be uh, achieved by these two configure options, the dash dash with long double 128 and dash dash with long double format IEEE. Um, yeah. And the, uh, the first one of those is the default actually. But. Yeah. Uh, the reason we want this is we want to move away from the IBM Double Double, which is more of a software type 128-bit system, to uh, Power9 added a, a hardware IEEE 128 instructions so much more faster. And, of course, as we kind of deprecate the older hardware, we want uh, everything to move faster. It does work on Power8, even though they don't have the instructions because they can use libgcc. Uh, it functions. Is, it isn't always faster than uh, double double. Double double mm. actually is faster in some cases. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. It's much harder to work with the results. So, yeah. Yeah. And uh, uh, IEEE quad is is IEEE, right? yeah. yeah. Which is kind of important. Yeah. Uh, one of the benefits we have here now is glibc, libgcc, libgfortran all simultaneously support both IEEE 128 and IBM Double Double. Uh, so it has uh, uh, entry points for d right. each type for all the functions. Yeah. Yep. Uh, and this has actually been changed in Fedora since Fedora 36, I believe, uh, was the first one. Um, Matthias, I think you had some a question earlier about when we were talking. You're good from when we were talking? Okay, perfect. Rel uh, 10 default. Rel 10, yes. Okay. We have. So you, you advised to, to build with Tune equals power. So you advise to, to build with tune equals power 10. Um, but uh, oh, you're talking about the last bullet? Yes. OK. So but um, so what the um, that's OK for IBM hardware. But for example, for the Raptor hardware, it's power nine. OK, I can tune for power 10. But what's the way forward there? This. W so this is only the affecting the instruction scheduling for the power 10. So it will run just on power. It will run fine on power nine, power eight. It's just we're expecting most of our users to be on power 10 systems. So we want the code to be tuned for the hardware that will be shipping. So we're not talking about making you change the dash dash with CPU, which def tells the ISA to use. So that's up to whatever the distro happens to uh, decide with. But we it, would like the tuning, at least, to be towards the newer hardware. If you are expecting most of your users to use Power 9, if you are expecting most of your users to use Power 9, then you shouldn't shoot <laughs> a laptop. Oh, right, right. 
Ja. Ja, den den you should just tune tune for power nine. Ja. Ja. So here are some just some of the GCC highlights that we had uh within the last I think year or so whatever. Uh in GCC, we've added some base Power 11 enablement to the compiler, so the options there, uh, on there. Uh, recently, with, PT, with Power 10, uh, part of the ISA, we've, we added PC relative instructions, first time Power has ever had that. Uh, a lot of benefits there. One of the one of the things that that freed up is the old non-PC relative used R2 as a talk pointer yep. to access our data. Uh, with PC relative, we don't need that talk pointer anymore. That's kind of out. Uh, and it was freed up, but we just never made use of it before. Uh, it's a volatile and not used for argument passing, so it's kind of a useful, uh, useful register to use. Uh, so we've actually changed the compiler now to be actually, uh, to make use of that so we get an extra uh, register to use. Uh, and it seems to work, actually. And it's, yes. Well, it actually is high or early in the register allocation order, so right. we use it heavily, uh, I mean, and it hasn't broken, so right. it works. I, I mean, this is one of those things, one of those patches that you expect will break the yeah. world, right? And the world hasn't broken yet. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, uh, okay, so the next piece here, uh, this was from Cohen, I think, made yeah. this one. Um, we had a hack in the compiler. Back in the day with GCC, there was a implicit assumption that all floating point types had an increasing precision value. Have a total order. Yeah, it had a total order. Um, and with us, with multiple 128-bit floating point types, we had a hack where we, because we have TF mode, IF mode, and KF mode. So we have three types. Uh, right. TF mode. Two types. IF mode. With IF mode and KF level, mode. Yeah. And KF mode with a quad. And TF mode is either, depends on your configuration. But it had a different precision. Yes. Yes. So it had, a, even though it was maybe KF mode or IF mode, it didn't have the same precision as those. So um, that made some of the old GCC stuff work, but it was problematic for, I think, GDB and some other things. I don't know, whatever. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so we've actually, Cohen went through and cleaned up all that. So now all our FP modes have 128-bit precision, which you would expect for 128-bit type. Uh, and it's a lot better. But the problem is that there are double-double uh, numbers which are not representable in uh, quad float, in quad position. And vice versa. And vice versa, yeah. of course, because yeah. it's an actual superset of uh, double precision. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, moving along here, we've also recently had some improvements from our code gen yeah. creating constants, uh, kind of in the old power... Uh, wave if you wanted to create a 64-bit uh, um, constant, integer constant, uh, it could take up to five dependent instructions uh, to create that. Uh, there's this is never a cheap way to do it. You can also do it with a single load instruction always. Yes, yeah. Uh, and we've talked about doing that for some, but uh, there were some special constants that have special... Um, uh, bit patterns that can be created with sometimes one or two instructions. And uh, uh, Jifu from our China lab went through and created uh, some some pat or some changes here. I think to the back end that uh, improves CodeGen for a lot of those things. Um, we've ac we've had some target vector cost improvements, which um, I think we, were they just wrong we had before? Do you remember? Yes. For some reason, uh, it's not tested correctly. Yeah. Probably because we don't have the infrastructure for that or something. I don't know. Yeah. So, I mean, that kind of improved 
it's, some of the, it's, the it's things that we have in mine and yours. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, some kind of random vector built-in cleanups and that. Uh, we've also had ROP fixes, what I've been kind of working on. That's return-oriented programming security feature. Uh, ROP prevention. Yeah. Um, so to protect against the saved return value being corrupted on the stack, uh, there were some bugs inefficiencies and the like uh, and I've so do you think it's perfect now no oh. there's so the current the current issue which is a, a bigger fix than the other ones we have here um, currently when we enable ROP we disable shrink wrapping right right um, yeah. I've enabled. I've in, in yeah. It is, yeah. I've enabled it for leaf functions because for leaf leaf functions we don't uh, save the right. save the return value on the stack, so there's no yeah. no need to actually do the ROP. The, but we were disabling it before I fixed that. But um, the ROP stuff, stuff always saves the hash that will have to match as like the first word on the stack, right? Yeah. Somewhere like it. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, but we should be able to do shrink wrapping and In theory, yeah. and um, and wrap at the same time. But there's some quirks on the load and store of the hash function. So we right. we we don't we don't create the hash and then store it and then load it and then unhash it. We have a combined instruction to do the hash and the store and then the right then the load and the check all in one instruction. And the problem with the, the encodings I think we had is we all have to use the caller's stack pointer to, to uh, execute, because I think we can only have negative offsets for our loads. Yes, yes, yes. Um, and so if we stack a frame, then we're on our own stack pointer value. And if we want to do the ROP, we have to almost Re and rematerialize the caller stack frame value so the, to do some of that. So that's going to be a little more work. So the hardware cost of Rob is Robert's prevention protection, whatever yeah. you want to call it, is pretty much zero. It's not yeah. quite zero. It uh, uh, adds some latency somewhere. If your functions are too short, too short, then it costs a few cycles to protect them. But well, if they're too short, well the if we don't stack a frame, we don't need to protect right, right, sure. protect it at all because we didn't store yeah, it out yeah. and it's not going to get corrupted. Yeah. So, um, so there's that. Yeah. Uh, but that's one of the but, future but, work but, items. But, but uh, a serious cost right now is that it's disabled swing wrapping. Yes. So yeah, yeah. I've I've done some tests and there were, I think, just on spec two to three percent. Uh, yeah, degradation, some, like I think, that. on spec using ROP. Um, and so I did the same, I had the same test done where I didn't do ROP, but then I did F no shrink wrap or whatever the, the option is, and I saw the exact same slowdown. So all of the slowdown had to do with shrink wrapping. Yeah. Uh, right, yeah. And so and this not the ROP. Spec testing. I, it was spec okay. testing, yeah. So that is a future work item, so hopefully we can mitigate uh, mitigate those slowdowns. Uh, let's see. We've also had some, Surya from our team has had some register allocation changes. Mm -hmm. One of them here, which had a little fallout on other ports, uh, was a, right. yeah. uh, a bug in the save or store cost for using non-volatile registers. Um, uh, the, the entry and exit blocks, so the, the old code would add basically one each time we would use a non-volatile register for the cost for saving, restoring type of stuff. But the problem is the frequency of the entry block is not one. It's like, I think I said a thousand or something like that. Um, and we weren't scaling that. And so that led us to, that led some, uh, non-volatile hard registers to have a lower cost than volatile registers. Uh, 
And so we would choose to use the non-volatile register, then we'd have stack a frame because we've used one of those things. And when you look at it, it's like there is a non-volatile unused. So it's like, why was the cost more? And so you had tracked that down to just this thing. And so we, uh, we made that change. It had some fallout on some of the other ports, not correctness fallouts. It was mainly just on some of the arm tests, they were generating different instructions. Sometimes it was better code. Yeah. Uh, so we just needed to update the test. They, that, there were a couple with extra copies. That, that's so often the case with tests, uh, target specific yeah. test cases. So often- Including they, our own. Including our own, sure, yeah. but those are target specific as well. Right? Yeah. Uh, but, uh, so often they expect more than they can depend on. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But you need to do a lot of work to analyze this and uh, uh, convince other target maintainers yeah. to change. The I mean, so there were some negative fallout there. Uh, on ARM, there were a couple, one or two tests where we actually have an extra copy uh, yeah. in the code. To me, the fix is obvious, obvious and correct. And the yeah. copy is a symptom of a different issue that needs to be tackled rather than, you know, backing this out. And I know there are cases where we actually see a, extra copies on power two and we're wanting to get rid of those. So those are things that we are we are looking at. It's a uh, uh, very sensitive code. So yeah. sometimes uh, obvious change uh, doesn't work. Yeah. <laughs> Even for me, I, I thought it also very obvious. Yeah. And I didn't expect any problems with this. Yeah, I spoke with Jeff uh, yesterday and he said that he had tested the uh, Surya's patch on risk 64 and he actually saw i think two to three percent like across the board speed up on a lot of their tests so it was definitely a a good change so and then we've done lots of bug fixes here on on other things as well kind of on the work in progress things things we're currently working on we of course we have say hers on cse and if you hopefully you were here and attended Sayher's talk. And that's that. in no way actually related to power. No. Of course, yes. it will help. No, 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 yeah. But it's yeah. from the team work right. that's okay. on here. Yeah. Um, and then, so the R8 work that Surya was doing there, this all actually has fallen under. I've tasked her to try to improve the number of shrink wrapping opportunities that we that we get, because um, we have quite a few issues of seeing test cases where it's, we could shrink wrap that, but we don't. Yeah. Um, so her finding these RA things were actually, these were her doing some analysis on some of the test cases. So what is she expecting? How many more can be shrink wrapped if she finishes whatever she is trying? I think a fair amount. Well, I, I think know, a fair amount. The theoretical, sort of theoretical. Yeah, my I, own theory. It doesn't. Mean I don't know. I just. I have I seen enough. Know. I've yeah. seen enough test cases that we don't shrink wrap that we should be able to shrink wrap. About, that about, it, it leads me to believe there's a fair amount out there. About four times more function can be shrink wrapped than currently mm -hmm. are shrinked. Okay. And then of course we have uh, what's it called. Uh, separately swing wrappable components whatever yeah. i can't remember what i called it myself so, uh, separate components or something i think you yeah, call it something yeah. like it, yeah. yeah so um sws yes so she's been tracking down some of the reasons why we don't shrink wrap uh, of course, we've caught some IRA and LRA issues, and so those are kind of the, the easy ones so, to attack. So uh, very often, uh, uh, if something cannot be swing wrapped, just simply moving a single instruction or a few instructions and move it to somewhere else in the same basic block even, yeah. fixes the problem. 
Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Well, that gets through my last bullet on here. Um, oh, but she, yeah. so she's going through, she's going through right now some of the non shrink wrap code issues on why we don't shrink wrap. And, and, uh, uh, so we had the, the, the first bullet here was the thing I talked about uh, earlier, the LRA patch, which was a patch that went in that actually had some fallout in a negative way, actually, we crit on some other ports, cr yeah. created uh, broken code. So we've reverted it, but we do need to fix it. It, it is a valid optimization that we want to do in LRA. We just have to go back and, and track down what was wrong with her uh, uh, patch as is. We didn't see any fallout on power, uh, but uh, so we, that's something that she'll be doing. But once we get some of those things fixed, then there's the, the limitations of the shrink wrap code itself. And in those cases, I think there's gonna be some, we're gonna need some form of live range splitting. Uh, well, live range splitting, the generic... A limited, a limited version. ...in case of live range splitting at, at the move instruction. Yeah. So, but yes. I don't know yeah. if you want mm -hmm. that. And I think Vlad wants, Vlad wants to say something here. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> That's okay. Uh, uh, there is a uh, live range splitting in uh, global register locator, but it's only on uh, region borders. It's, yeah. It's, it was... Uh, done by design, but I think LRA could implement this. And we could, uh, again, uh, do some optimization for spill placement. It's not, should be in the same block, for example, where call is, it yeah. would be some. Well, and I think it would be, use, it'd be useful outside of shrink wrapping too, for some of these things. But uh, it will be not easy. Yeah, and and, and, and the, it's not easy. yeah, yeah, and the live range splitting. Obviously, this is not going to be some. This is going to be live range because there the the shrink wrapper has a routine to. I believe it does some splitting now, but it's very very. Uh, limited on what it right, does, right. and I th what I've wa what I want. You mean the, in the current code? In the current yeah, code, right? There's a function called like prepare shrink wrap, I think. Yeah. And that that does a very limited thing. Yes, and I think we need to uh, I, increase I the amount there. Have never ever seen a test case where it works. Oh, you mean where the current code kicks in? The current code right, oh. kicks in, yeah. yeah. Well, I have seen one, but that one was made especially for... Yeah. yeah. So this is going to be a little... What I think we need to do is be a little more general there. Yeah. Um, but only do the shrink wrapping such that it helps. So, so we... Or the splitting that it helps shrink wrap. We should have some prepare shrink wrap thing, something like it. Yeah. Something that runs somewhere there. And it can add extra instructions, so an extra move or whatever. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And uh, move a, uh, it, sh it should move a lot of instructions to different ba basic blocks. And that is difficult to do. Yeah. Be because of lifetime, whatever. Those are, those are hard red Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but I mean, it's things we need to look at if we want to increase the number of shrink wrap opportunities. Yep. So I'm going to move on. Yep. Uh, GLibc side of things, one of the announcements. I'm the new power uh, e port ma maintainer for GLibc. Raji, who was our previous maintainer, uh, she was the lead of GLibc and our AI libraries team. Uh, She's been spending lots and lots and lots more time on the AI libraries, adding power optimizations on those libraries that so she didn't have time to G of C, so I inherited the job. She has chosen what she finds more interesting. Yeah, yeah. And it's not G of C. <laughs> yeah. uh, some of the other things, again, we added base power 11 enablement yeah. to glibc. Uh, we've added some power 10 optimized string functions. Right, right. Uh, We've added the AT Hardware Cap 3 and AT Hardware Cap 4 macros. I've, so I added those macro defines to the kernel so we could import them into glibc. We, don't, we haven't run out of AT Hardware Cap 2 features yeah. yet. Um, yes. 
yes. yet, yes. but yes. we are we are getting close. And I talked with Andrew Pinsky, and I think, or no, it was somebody else. I think on Arch 64, where they're starting to get close to running out of feature bits and AT Hardware Cap 2, so they will need these yeah. bits as well. In the first Hardware Cap, uh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Yep. So those will be there. Um, the reason we are doing this now, even though we don't need it, is unlike some other architectures, we. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. yeah, we're doing it in time. Well, we don't say early. Yes, it's not early. We're doing it in time. It, it is, yeah, it is in early. time. Okay, yeah. yeah. Uh, is that we store copies of our AT hardware cap bits on our thread control block yeah. uh, thing. So it's kind of an ABI extension, and we do this for our CPU supports and CPU is built-in functions. So we don't have to actually call glibc. They're just, glibc kind of makes uh, this copy for us. And then yeah. we just, to do a built-in CPU supports, we do a load from, based off R3, which is our thread pointer yeah. thing. We do a compare and a branch and we're into our optimized code. Right. Uh, so but because of this- Single instruction. Yes. yes. But because this is kind of an ABI extension, by the time we want it, we want, the shipping compilers and libraries already have it inside them, uh, so it's just there. And to be even more prepared for the future, we didn't just do a hardware cap free, but also hardware. Yes. Core. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So we, by the time those are needed, we'll be yeah, retired, yeah. and then we won't have to worry that somebody else's problem. Well, uh, if everything goes well, yes. Yeah. Well, if it's All right. And then to go along with the ROP changes on the GCC side, we've also have started. Submitting Sachin, who's one of my GLBC developers, uh, has been working adding ROP support to the uh, GLBC. We're doing this for Power 8 and later because the Binutils only accepts the ROP instructions for right. Power 8 and later, even though the ROP instructions only do anything on Power 10. On previous yes. instructions, they just work as no op. So you can have the code yeah. in your binaries, you run it on a power eight, power nine, and it won't be secure, uh, but it will run. Right. But then you take that same binary, move it to a power 10, and then you're secure. And it actually works on power seven and later. But there's all the there's, yeah, there. and, and, and I we th don't think so anyone will want to run a rope enabled yeah. stuff on a power seven. Yeah. The main job on this stuff is there's lots of hand assembler files there, and we need to go in and and add that uh, add that by default, and uh, so that's it. okay. So that's the end of kind of our talk. I, mm -hmm. Ben Utils has been kind of quiet. Uh, we haven't had any new CPUs, and it should be. Yeah. Right. Hopefully, the only the only big news on the Ben Util side was Alan Moder from our team retired earlier this year. Unfortunately, I I tried to convince him to keep working, but it didn't. Uh, I didn't work. <laughs> I think anyone interested in Ben Utils will notice anyway. But yeah. So luckily, he's still kind of in the community, uh, working just not as busy as as before. But now we can open it up here. Um, so from your team's perspective. Um, who do you see stepping in to fill Alan's shoes or Alan's role? No one. We have no one right <laughs> That's now. Very fast. Answer. Well, yeah. so on the bin util side, there are basically two parts. There's the assembler and the linker. Uh, Alan and I have both done the assembler part. So new instructions and all that type of stuff. I, 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 I can do those types of things. It's when we have linker issues, you know, a new relocation or something. Only for like the power cord. Well, that's, that's new yeah. features can good. often require hardware support, like packed relocations. They yeah. may not matter to you, but if DT Reller is in any way applicable, then you're like, well, how, what do you do about it? And so I think there are features that show up that sometimes yeah. have an ELF impact, GABI impact, and then the port has to make a choice about something. Correct. And then has to do some kind of implementation, and the implementation yeah. is usually dependent on ISA features or ABI features or procedure call standard features so, that you just have to decide. So it's, we don't have our head in the sand. 
on this. We know that's a, a big loss. Uh, and we've, I've talked with some of our management about we need to find someone to backfill for him. It, we were hoping we had actually started someone to start learning while Alan was still with us. But uh, we had another retirement and the person who was going to fill in for Alan then took over the leadership of the Golang team. Uh, Paul Murphy, I don't know if you remember mm -hmm. Paul Murphy. So he was going to kind of come in, but now he's busy leading the Golang team. Uh, and so now we're back to needing to, yeah. needing to find someone. And you're probably looking at someone who is going to look at, well, there's not just uh, LDBFD issues, but then there are probably LLD issues as well because the LVM linker also gets used in some situations. We have, I mean, like from a distro perspective, the, the two prominent linkers are LDBFD, which serves as the exemplar ELF linker, yeah. right? People look at it when they say, what is the output supposed to be? What choices has the Linux ecosystem made around the GABI and the specific ABI extensions to ELF for Linux? And then everybody kind of implements afterwards. But there's still sometimes pieces to fill in in LLD as well. Yeah. So the LLD there's, there's pretty part... There's a broad role to fill there. Yes. Well, Alan has never worked on the LLD portions of the yeah. of LLVM. Yeah. I believe maybe some of the IBM Toronto people who have kind of picked up the LLVM work and and that. I maybe they have someone there. I could probably reach out to see if they have anybody on that part. Um, there, there but there is no one in IBM who works on. LLDB, LL, whatever, linker. That's not entirely true. I don't know if that's true. No one at IBM because um, the, the Z series team is adding S390X support to LLD yeah. because we need, we really need the reference elf linker, LDBFD, yeah. and we need LLD because application choices. Some upstreams may say, no, we are going to get built with Clang and link with uh, LLD. And we're like, that's fine. If it produces an output ELF binary that we can load with a dynamic loader, we're fine. Yeah. But 390 is completely separate from PowerPC. Yes. yes. But you said no one at IBM. Yeah. <laughs> there very well could be someone in IBM Toronto. Uh, uh, Working on it, yeah. Since they use like LLVM, them and just like maybe we invite them and have them come to Cauldron, or yeah, maybe I'd have to check out to, with the team, you know, for the next one. Yeah, yeah, maybe. Uh, and we will be so jealous if they get permission to come here. <laughs> <laughs> they get funding to come here. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. So that, but that is a question about at least on the libbfd side of finding someone to backfill for, for the loss of Alan. I mean, if something were to come up today, I probably would have to, because I think maybe I'm the closest and maybe I, I still have Alan's email so I can ask Alan, because we've had a problem recently on, uh, this is a relocation yeah. overflow? Yeah, on oh, Julio, yes. <laughs> well, Loader issues in that I still don't think he was static linker, you know, things, but yes. We'll train him. <laughs> but that would be great if we want to use, you know, if you're offering up Tulio to take over the linker, so, uh, I'm happy with that. But, but like, I'll be honest, like we face, as from a distribution perspective, we face, um, you say from a distribution perspective, Red Hat, knee IBM face a longevity question, which is, we have a number of architectures that several business units care about, and we have to maintain ELF linkers for them. Mm -hmm. And we can't expect the rest of the world to maintain the ELF linkers for the, art, for the hardware that we build. So in that case, we also have to look at, like, how old is Nick Clifton, right? Nick, yeah. Nick's been working for Cygnus for, like, a super long time. Nick's going to retire at some point, and so... No, he's never going to retire. He's the only remaining maintainer, so... Yeah. Um, no, and I, I, like... We also don't have our head in the sand, and we are also, you know, looking at, like, who's, who do we train? How do we train them? Because it, it takes a while. It takes a, it takes a while. I think that you'll see more people working on uh, bin utils that previously hadn't worked on bin utils. And specifically, I, I would love to see the, um, I know it's not done yet, but I'd love to see the parallel P-thread pieces for 
uh, parallel link in Bing Utils that um, mm -hmm. Susie was looking at? The Bing Utils both is tomorrow at 2 yeah. p.m. I can ask, yeah. yeah. We'll be there. Yeah, you better. So do we need to do we need to fly Tulio in for that? Let him know that he's going to be working on on the linker on power. Wow! <laughs> All right. Uh, you need to tell him to prepare for yeah. that. <laughs> yeah. Luckily, Alan has not disappeared from the community. Right. Um, so we did we did have a, a, a relocation issue that I was able to email Alan. It's like. Not to fix it, but at least give me some input some it. some input about what the issue was, and uh, of course, you know, one comment from Alan's like, "This is what the problem yeah. is." Yeah. yeah, well, it wasn't a patch. No, it wasn't a patch because it was actually it was a it was a relocation error at runtime. Okay. But he was telling me that we shouldn't have that at runtime, and he said that's actually 32-bit data relocation error or. A data 32-bit Big Indian relocation in a 64-bit bi LE binary, so that's wrong. And so then that told me exactly then where to go. Then it was obvious to me what the problem was. We fixed the it's we fixed not, the, 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 the assembler that code. The allocation doesn't work. It should never have been there. Yes, exactly. It was in libself, I think it was, or Ceph, libself, or I yeah, think it was. Could, could be. So. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so that was fixed. So he's he's still there, and I can st he's still a fountain of information that I hopefully that I can that I can go Extract. talk to. Yeah. Yeah. So, any other questions from? Yes. Yeah, hold on. Just leave it with him. <laughs> um. One of the things that I would really like to see is a, a pre-commit CI tester for power. I talked to, so, I had so lunch with it, Christoph today. The reason I'll say is because at one point we totally broke the Power 10 build, but because we were only building like Power 9, we didn't notice how busted we'd gotten. Yes. And then, and then I realized, oh, shucks. We're like, we weren't even looking at building the Power 10 pieces and glibc and stuff. And we, we ended up having to backport a bunch of things to get Power 10 into, like, back to its well, and, state. And, and that was a, that was a post-commit error, wasn't it? Because then we ran it and saw it. And I was, yeah. I, had, I had to go to my team. It's like, well, why didn't we see that, like, right away? And, and I think that just calls out again for, like, so I, I've been working with uh, Bruce Gilkey's who is the um, a community, uh, ad, community um, like steward at IBM, but he run, he's on the IBM uh, Linux One Cloud piece. So I get access to S390X hardware through Bruce. And then for glibc as an as a open source project, I can set up an S390X pre-commit CI builder that, that, that is a Red Hat pre-commit CI builder. And we, we can use those resources, but Power's much like harder. I don't know how to get access to power. We, we I, have I really would want power ten hardware, but you're going. You run op, You run into operational issues because you're consuming patches that are like, so, from anywhere. So we have the power ten compile farm system, which is a big right. system. And uh, it's a single system. It's a single so, big system. Lots of memory, but we also have other. There are other. There's a. We, so we sent there, multiple P10s. There's, there's a bunch in. Uh, so Oslo, Oslo. yeah. So we sent multiple P10s to the Oregon State Lab or whatever that's hooked up to the compile farm. One of them is the compile farm system, but we have another one that can be partitioned up. Yeah. And it is people, all you have to do is go and ask, I need a Power 10 system for a CI builder, and you can get a Power 10 yeah. uh, partition to run things so on. So you just need to talk to your lungs. Yes. Yes, and I can, I can get a name of the people that you would need to talk to to get a partition if you want to run a CI, CI build yourself just, just on there. But I did talk with, I did talk with uh, Christoph at, at lunch today and a little before yeah. about getting that set up. Um, I'm a little frightened about the whole Jenkins stuff, but... 
So, um, okay. may I give some of that? Sure. So, um, I would not initially do, if you don't want to, the Jenkins Builder. So we wrote a prototype, uh, DJ Delory put okay. together a prototype. And the prototype is literally shell script, pod man, and you run, the con you run a Fedora container in disconnected mode. And you run basically, it, it has all the pieces in place to basically run a disconnected mode, make check inside of a container. Obviously, the uh, the... There are some tests that end up being unsupported because your container instead of a container doesn't work and some tests don't work, but you go through 99% of the tests. So what you really need is you need a VM on a, you need a VM, and then you uh, use the, just the container disconnected network isolation as your thinnest layer there, and that thing just runs, and all it does is it checks patchwork, sees if a new thing came in, then it just kicks off another build, and it gets results. So it uses the same underlying patchwork scraper that pulls the patches off there, but just not the Jenkins well, part or whatever. Uh, correct. So um, did you talk, to, so it's Linero who you talked to, right? Yes. Christophe Leon from Linero. So the Linero setup is way, does way more than what we do. Yeah. So the Linero okay. setup can do multi-component regressions. Like it can, it can see that if you put in a glibc, change, and then that broke the tool chain bootstrap, it can know that and then come back and say, fail, right? And it can point out what part of the tool chain bootstrap failed that, that you had done a thing. And it can do multi-component regression and then changes one component at a time until it finds, the com finds a component to blame yeah. for the regression, right? And then it advances a baseline. It can also find flaky tests and when it finds flaky tests, it auto, it, it auto marks the flaky tests. And then at the end of the month, it pulls them back up for review and resets them and then sees if they're flaky again. But it hides that from you okay. in the complexity. But you definitely have to get a Jenkins builder and all the scripts. Yeah. So, we, so what I told DJ when we initially did this with GLBC is it has to be easy. It yep. has to be simple or none of the IHBs are going to be able to roll it out. And so I minimally wanted a framework in which a make check based project could just run uh, securely inside of a container. And that's what we're using for GPC. So, so, the so is there a wiki box. that kind of describes yes. the steps that we need? Okay. So, so, where, so, where, so where do we... We have, a, we have boxes. We have a lot of internal boxes. But, but then you give the software to us. The, sure. the what I, yeah. I, I mean, yeah. Or I guess my point is that I would love the IHBs to maintain their thing because yeah. it's it's your hardware, you yeah. know it, and when it falls over, you're the you're also the best place to go and debug. Like, yeah. What happened with that patch? Why who's touching the generic code? Why did the generic code fall over in the like power target port? Like so those kinds of things are really useful because then when something fails the two people that I connect together are who is the hardware vendor whose CI system failed and who is the person contributing the patch? Because they're trying to do something and you're trying to keep it working. Yeah. And so then, then you can then have a conversation and start talking to this person and say, what did you do? Like, what was your assumption that broke the target backend or something else? So... Yes, yeah. So I think it'd be great and I think all you really need is a, I would say, a Power 10 box that you can then run these scripts on. And it's not that hard to yeah. run the scripts. Okay. This, way, this sounds more doable. Zero this... dependencies on yes. Jenkins. Okay. It is That's... script, but you need Podman. So because you need a way to run the isolated, containerized, C group, name, uh, namespace isolated build so that you get some safety and you're not running rando code inside that. Yeah, Podman is a containerization. Well, it's a front end that runs on top of uh, basically C run, which is uh, it runs on everything else. So and it's available on it's on Rel it's FOSS. nine. It's full FOSS. Yeah, it's okay. on Rel nine because yeah. we on our 100%. on our big P ten box we Rel run Rel nine on perfect there, so. Rel nine. The only if you ran Rel seven, I'd say you have problems. 
But if you're on Rel 9, you get Podman we, right away. We have been told Rel 7 has to go on all our yes. big, big Indian systems, and which is killing us because we want to continue tasting on the older hardware instead of just running P7 binaries on a P8. We want to, we want to catch when we're generating P8 instructions and on a P7 when we shouldn't be. In, you then in can't. The, you can't change anything in rel 7 because 7 yeah. at extended up so, yeah. support and it is so like you'd have to have a mission so they're they're disappearing basically we've had to switch all of our rel 7 systems for our big indian boxes to debian unstable because that's about the only distro that builds 64 bit things and it's not even official it's just kind of a an unofficial yeah. thing We'll have to do it, do it with the uh, C farm power seven as well, because it, uh, uh, what's the OS called that that actually is well seven but not marketed by what is it? Centos seven. Centos, yeah, Centos seven. Uh, but it stopped support like it, almost a year ago now. Yeah. yeah, you won't have any security updates. Right. And that's probably yeah. why you moved on. To yeah. So, it's, it's so still there. Perfect. And then you can you can run the build in your line. The point is, it pulls down a Fedora container and does the build. Yeah. In well, on our development boxes, we want the newer distro because the newer tools and all that. It was for the older systems running, you know, big Indian, older hardware that we wanted to. Well, because Rel8 does not support big Indian. You know, SUSE dropped it. All that. Yes. Is the thing we can do. Yeah. Okay. Cool. So if you you say there is a wiki for DJ yeah. stuff, uh, it's a uh, you can send me an email. It's glibc cicd on the wiki page. Okay. And uh, DJ, we have a GitLab project for it. It's got all the extensions in it. It's the reference implement. So it is a reference implementation. Yep. For example, like when Maxim came and said, like, how do I hook up to Patchwork? I said, here's the reference implementation. You, oh, so they the built their it. stuff on top of yours. They, okay. No. So no? they or? used glibc CICD as the reference implementation to go, oh, how do you talk to Patchwork? Okay. How do I do a proper REST API pull? It, the, the reference implementation has examples of how we did it. Yep. And the examples are simple enough that you can see, oh, that's how you did, that's how you connected to it, that's how you pull from it, that's how you get the the queue of events because Patrick has an event-based queue and you can look at the events and like, but if you just take what we have in C GLC CICD, yep. all you have to do is write a shell script that gets run inside the container and that shell script just, you can look at the current one and just basically- And I, I the assume as a beginning thought. step, we can run this whole thing without any patches, right? So we can just build yeah. current- yeah. Top of GCC or top of glibc and yeah. run Clearly it. The script just only see. support building glibc, but there's no reason why it can't build any arbitrary project that just runs make check. Okay. You just you define a POSIX shell script that runs all the commands, and that's what runs inside the container when it when it does. Okay. Because we have our own post commit build scripts that we use. Post commit is too late. Yes, no, 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 but I mean, it's, it's the scripts yeah. we use for yes. building post commit, but we script. could we could use those same scripts for doing this pre-commit part. 100%, you can put them in, we can commit them to the repo, we can make changes to the repo, yeah. we can add, in fact, I have to go and add S390X support to it myself, because that's, I, I'm doing that just to show DJ that we can extend the rest of the little pieces of the repo, but it's basically just a matter of, adding a bunch of extra shell scripts and some extra Python scripts that run the, run the build isolated in the container. Okay. It's like, then the, the only, the ongoing maintenance is that that system has to stay up. It's little daemon process has to stay up because the daemon process is basically going to patchwork and then checking the event queue, seeing how many, at any events arrived since I got here last. Oh yeah, there's been three new patch series posted Okay, grab the first patch series, and then it does its thing. And all that glue is already there yeah. because you can see it in our bots today on glibc. So we need the um, Well, so the question is, I look at it for glibc every week, and if if a C one of the in again, you're an interested party. You register yourself as a CI pre-commit CI system. Yeah. 
and then you get to submit, pass, warn, fail, right? And so if I keep seeing passes, that's great. But if a patch comes in and it's a fail for the power builder, I can then go to the person on the list and say, look, you failed CI. You need to find out why. We're not going to review your patch. Yeah. And then that person, then we have a list of who's accountable for the CI systems because there, it has to be an accountable person for that CI system. If it's you, Peter, then I say to the reporter, look, Peter is accountable for the CI system. He'll be able to tell you why that might have failed on power. Let's yeah. start a conversation on the list. But uh, you say uh, uh, you write to the committer, uh, it failed on power. Uh, but that includes just a URL to somewhere where they can see what exactly failed, right? Log file. So there, there are a couple of wrinkles here. Um, well, no. Uh, so yes, you generally need to have a place where you can store log files. And so that means that you have to copy those log files to somewhere and either make them accessible via like static websites or not, right? You can uh, just post that it failed. It failed make check or something. You can choose not to expose any information. The honest truth is uh, today for the i686 builder, we post a bunch of logs and the Linero team posts a bunch of logs too. But in truth, the logs can be used to exfiltrate data from these systems and actually get, if you can get data out from the systems, then you can run, uh, you can run compute on them and then get out like mined bitcoins or something mm -hmm. like via the logs. That's a bit silly. No one's ever done that yet. But from an OPSEC perspective, technically all we should be doing is reporting uh, the fail. So where do you post your glibc results on your CI builder? Is there a mailing list that you send it to? Or like you said, where, yeah. so people outside can see it. So the, when you, uh, REST API, when you use the REST API to uh, talk to Patchwork, when you post a CI result, the result has a bunch of data in the field. And the model is that that data can include a URL. And so you are allowed to, in the REST API for Patchwork, post a check result, because these are called check results, and the model for the check result has a URL. And then that URL just takes you to mm. a landing page for your, the check that failed. And your checker produces that URL, can produce it uniquely. So for example, from when, we, when the glibc CI CD system builds that, it copies the output results to a uniquely named path that's being exported in real time out via uh, Apache server that's got a HTTP yeah. point. You have so that might, that might be hard for us to find a external website to dump data. Now, well, something like the GCC test suites mailing list, which is what we do on our post commits CI builder, you know, we post our results every day on all the different runs that we had. Uh, maybe we could have a different looking test results so, I mean, message that... You could, so you can... Like your, your CI checker could post to the mailing list. Yeah. You'd have to wait for the mailing list post to arrive, get the URL, and then use that URL to fill in the check result. But you'd have to wait till it yeah. shows up and wait till the archiver picks it up. But if it's public inbox or Piper Mail, it's relatively fast. But you yeah. still, you know what I mean? You still need to write that little piece at LinkedIn. Yep. If you don't want to host the things yourself and you want to just post a static link of it. I don't know that we have that. And I think in the past, we've not been able to to do that. To you know. post files somewhere. Yeah. Then don't, and in the checker results, you can include a bit of text that says, the following test failed. Yeah. And then when the person reaches out to you. And here's the email address, uh, you know, me, reach out for more details. Yeah. Right. yeah. And then you can make an informed decision of how much to share and what to share. Yeah. Yeah. But because I mean, like, honestly, it is an operational security issue. We really sh probably should only be posting pass, warn, or fail. And we internally keep the data. And then when someone comes to us yeah. and they say, I had this token and this token said I failed. So yeah. you can say fail, uh, you know, test such and such failed. And you can say, uh, reach out to uh, Peter Bergner, uh, token number this. And then in the internal system that you have, you've got a directory with the token number and the 
full build log okay. with all the data in it. Yeah. And you can say, oh yeah, I went and I looked at it. That For that token number, it failed like this. Here's the, here's the reason why. Yeah. Um, I think even before I would do that, if, if we were to email it out, I would put out the config options that we use. So if they had access to like the C farm system on a P10, they could go out and, well, this is how they built it. Let me try it. And hopefully they, they see the fail then too. And then they wouldn't even have to come so, to me. But. So how much, how much data space does it use for a single run that it needs to save, right? Well, the question is, how much do we save for a single run? Nothing. We throw it all away. We only keep like, like the build log output text to barely figure out what had happened because it should be reproducible. Yeah, because right. From the state of that system, you do a git checkout right. for that time. You do a git pw and you apply the patches and you, then you run... Uh, configure, make, make, check, and it should fail yeah. identically. Because hopefully, it it's, hopefully it's pass, 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 and you throw all the stuff away, and it's only on the fails that it's like, okay, I'll just recreate it by hand then. Yeah. And then... Correct. Just, okay. So, worker system, right? Uh, it has no maintenance issues, normal system maintenance, like disk full, right? Um... Well, we run into the occasional, like, power is being shut down because there's a maintenance issue, and then you have to take the server down and then take the server back up again. But when the server comes back up again, it just goes to patchwork, and it says, oh, when was my last event that I handled? And then it just restarts that event in the queue and then goes on. So sometimes we'll come in, like, on a Monday morning, and, like, no one's told us something, and we're, the queue is short or something, and so... Uh, I think we didn't set it up to auto restart via system D, so we have to go restart it manually. So, but when it restarts manually, then it just picks up the queue again and it so, carries on. So can you keep up with the patches? With glibc easily. And it really depends. If you tell me, if, like, if, I think if you want to do a full bootstrap GCC, this is, that would be a different issue because right. that's a lot I mean, of compute. Because we can't even, even for our post commit, we can't do... Given all the tests that we do, we can't keep up with every commit. What is so we test we kind of jump up, we test. If we don't see any regressions from here to here, we say okay, everything in there is good, and we continue. And so when we see a failure, then we get bisect. We don't, then we get bisect. We That's how we do it. Right. The, the, but I'm just saying, if you can't keep up with the queue on the GCC side... The test suit doesn't take so much time. Bootstrap takes yeah. slightly more time than running the whole test suit. Or systems are quite parallel. 